regarding hellfire, would God really do that? Okay? So, Sorry, we're, we're trying to get our note, folks. Well, it was many years ago in the time of the Bible that they took him up to Calvary. Up to Calvary. They couldn't let him go, but instead they chose Barabbas just to set another criminal free. When they free. crucified the ever-loving, caring master with compassion flowing from his eyes. Well, he said to a thief who was begging him for mercy that today you'll live in paradise. Mm, and I'm saved. I'm saved like the criminal on the cross. Praise God, I'm saved. I'm saved. No more to suffer loss. He said I'd live in paradise. Taking care of the cost. Hallelujah, I'm saved. I'm saved, I'm saved like the criminal on the cross. Well, on the judgment day, when all the people gathered around him and they wait to hear what he would declare, there will never ever be more intense anticipation that has ever happened anywhere. When they call my name to defend my reputation, there is only one thing I can say. I'm a wretch, I'm a worm, I'm a no good sinner, but he said I'll save you anyway. Mm, and I'm saved. I'm saved like the criminal on the cross. Praise God, I'm saved. I'm saved. No more to suffer loss. He said I'd live in paradise. He's taking care of the cost. Hallelujah, I'm saved. I'm saved like the criminal on the cross. Well, I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm saved through Jesus. I'm saved. Through Jesus, I am well, saved. I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm saved. His mercy showed the way. His mercy showed the way. I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm saved. No more for me to say. No more for me to well, say. I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm saved in paradise today. Well, it was many years ago in the time of the Bible that they took him up to Calvary. Up to Calvary. They couldn't let him go, but instead they chose Barabbas just to set another criminal free. Just to set when they free. crucified a loving, caring master with compassion flowing from his eyes. Well, he said to a thief who was begging him for mercy that today, today you'll live in paradise. paradise. Mm. And I'm saved, I'm saved like the criminal on the cross. Praise God, I'm saved, I'm saved, no more to suffer loss. He said I'd live in paradise. He's taking care of the cost, hallelujah, I'm saved. I'm saved, I'm saved like the criminal on the cross. I'm saved, I'm saved like the criminal on the cross. Praise God, I'm saved, I'm saved, no more to suffer loss. He said I'd live in paradise. He's taking the cost, hallelujah, I'm saved. I'm saved like the criminal on the cross. I'm saved, I'm saved. Like the 
criminal on the cross. Praise the Lord. Share what we've got, cause we've all got a lot of things to share together. Share what we've got, cause we've all got a lot of love to last forever. Share what we've got, cause we've all got a lot of things to share together. Share what we've got, cause we've all got a lot of love to last forever. When you are asked to be of service, Not just one mile, go with them too. When they are hungry and are needing special help, deep in your heart you know exactly what to do. Share what we've got, cause we've all got a lot of things to share together. Share what we've got, cause we've all got a lot of love to last forever. Jesus can now be shown to others. They cannot see him until we care. It is not Jesus when we keep him to ourselves. Oh, no, no. You can be sure it's not love until we share. Share what we've got, cause we've all got a lot of things to share together. Share what we've got, cause we've all got a lot of love to last forever. Share what we've got, cause we've all got a lot of things to share together. Share what we've got, cause we've all got a lot of love to last forever. Of love to last forever. Of love to last forever. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, let's thank you, Vocali, for that special music. This time we're going to um, have a word of prayer, and we'll go right into our, our next study. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you so much for the ministry of music. Lord, now as we open up your word again, I pray for the Holy Spirit to once again be poured out and to guide and to lead our study. Please, dear God, I pray that you would make it very plain and very clear. Help us, Lord, to understand the truth as it is in Jesus. Bless us now, Lord, as we go into this next topic, which is one that has caused many people to turn their backs on you. Because it's a, it's, it's a, it's a subject, Lord, that people, that the devil has really caused confusion when it comes to who you are and your character. I pray now that you would just speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's go right into it. Again, our, our uh, four principles. Four principles. God is love, number one. Number two, the whole Bible is to be our guide. Number three, the Bible cannot contradict itself. Number four, 
we ought to read everything in context. Um, I will I will share that there was a, there was a there was a last night there was a um, text that was brought up by a, by a dear friend of mine regarding um, regarding what it means in one in one scripture where God says that man cannot see my face and live. You guys familiar with that? Where God said, you know, to Moses, he says that man is not able to see my face and live. And then when it comes to Jacob, Jacob says that I have seen the face of the Lord and I have lived. Right. So let me let me just share with you um, something regarding that. It's important for us to understand that it's important for us to understand that oftentimes in the Hebrew language, in the Hebrew language, the the face of God, when, it, when, when somebody says that I have seen the face of God or that. Yeah, I've seen the face of God. The Hebrew actually says presence of God. And so just because it says face in, the, in, our, in our translation doesn't necessarily mean that that individual saw God's face and lived. It simply means that they were in the presence of God, and therefore that's why that language is used, that I've seen the face of God. So face and presence are synonymous at times in the Hebrew language when it comes to describing when people have an encounter with God, okay? So there's really no contradiction in that. It's just simply saying, um, like when Jacob, you know, um, had this encounter with God, he was saying that I saw the face of God, but he was really saying that I was in the presence of God. I was in the presence of God, okay? And uh, so I hope that, that uh, that's helpful. We'll, we'll uh, get into uh, more questions a little bit later on in our series, but let's go into hellfire. Would God really do that? Would God really do that? This is a hot topic, by the way. <laughs> um, and, and this is one that has caused confusion in many Christian circles. And one that has caused many people to turn, to turn their backs on God or to turn away from God. Because they can't reconcile. They can't reconcile the notion or the idea that um, if God is a loving God and God is, is who he claims to be, then why on earth would he torture or torment people forever and ever in hellfire? eternally i mean that just doesn't sound that just doesn't add up in, in many people's minds and if and in the minds of many they think well if god is like that then i want nothing to do with that god let me let me just announce to you tonight that if there's that if there's anyone and one of the things i like when i go out and i and i share messages like this if there's anyone in that has an idea like that or they have a picture of god like that and they don't they don't believe in that kind of a god i want to let you know that i don't believe in a God that torments people forever and ever as well. Would you say amen? I don't believe in that God. Say, that's not my God. My God doesn't, my God doesn't torment and, and, um, and uh, you know, torture people for, uh, for eternity. And by the way, let me ask you another question. Um, ha is hell burning right now? Okay. I mean, there's a lot of people who actually think that hell is somewhere in the center or the core of the earth. That somehow, some way, that the devil, that the devil, um, dressed up in this red jumpsuit, you know, with horns and with a with a with a pointy tail and with a pitchfork, somehow he's down there roasting people right now, or that they are in in hellfire right now, burning and burning and burning, and that somehow God has put him in charge of hell, and that God is up in heaven, he's in hell, and that somehow, some way, they work in, or they work together or they collaborate, or they're in cahoots together. Let me share something with you, beloved. The Bible tells us that God does nothing in partnership with the devil. Okay? Nothing. So I don't want us to get the, this picture that the devil is somehow down there in the center of the earth, and he's, he's got people on a spit right now, and he's turning them slowly like rotisserie chicken and burning them and burning them, and they can never die. Beloved, I want to share with you that that is a, such a misrepresentation of God, the God that we love and serve. And so I want to go right into the lesson study for this evening. Notice what it says on the inside cover of your study guide. When Mary Ellen was asked why she was a practicing witch, the answer she gave surprised the questioner. She said, as a child, I was raised in a hellfire and brimstone spitting church. I was told God would burn people even old people and little children, for as long as time should last. I decided that if that's what God is like, I'd, better, I'd be better off without him. Mary Ellen wrestled with a commonly asked question, would God really do that? Would God really do that? So let's tackle, let's tackle this subject tonight. Um, hellfire, would God really do that? Question number one, what is God really like? What is God really like? Well, the Bible describes it for us 
is also our first principle of true Bible interpretation. First John chapter 4 verse 8 tells us that God is what, everybody? That, that God is love. <coughs> Excuse me. That God is love. So it's important for us to know that the Bible describes God as love. The Bible describes God as love, and so it's important for us to understand that. And by the way, out of his love, out of his love flows everything else. Out of his love flows everything else, including judgment. All right? I think one of the things that has happened in the Christian world especially is that people have actually separated the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament, thinking that they're two different kinds of gods, when in actuality they're one and the same. All right? Um, in the Old Testament, you also find grace. All throughout the Old Testament, you find grace. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 6 um, that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And by the way, God had given the antediluvian world, that generation in Noah's time, he had given them 120 years of grace, of probation, to, 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 to repent and to turn away from their sins. But after 120 years, after 120 years, and they did not repent, they did not accept God's gift of salvation and his grace, the Bible tells us that the ark, the door of the ark was what? Slammed shut. And when the door of the ark was slammed shut, probation had closed upon them. And they, they now were lost or they were outside of the ark. I want you to notice it says that God is love. God is love. Let's go to question number two. Although it might not be always possible to understand the providence of God, I'm just reading um, what the study guide says here. Although it might not be always possible to understand the providence of God, the Bible clearly states that God is love. Question number two. What is God's desire for the entire human family? What is God's desire for the entire human family? Please notice. Please notice the heart of God. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. By the way, in this chapter, the context, it talks about scoffers. It says that in the last days, there will be scoffers. There will be those people who go around, and when the messages like this are being presented, they're going to scoff at it. They're going to mock it. They're going to scoff. They're going to mock. They're going to ridicule. Um, they're, going to, they're going to question. And here's the thing. They're, going to, they're, they're basically going to laugh at it. They're going to say, man, listen, Brother Nehemiah, you know what you're sharing and all the things that you're teaching, man, um, earthquakes, crime, all this stuff, that's always taken place. That has always happened since uh, the history of man began. He said, so what's the difference now? And beloved, I want to share with you that as we get closer and closer to the second coming of Jesus Christ, this world becomes darker and becomes colder. That's the reason why I know that the second coming of Jesus Christ is very, very near. Would you say amen? But before, but before Jesus returns to this planet, I want you to notice, I want you to notice the desire of God. It says that the Lord is, by the way, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness. But is, but is not willing that any should what? That any should perish, but that all should come to what? Repentance. You see the heart of God in that? The heart of God is he doesn't want anyone to perish. He doesn't want anyone to be lost. He wants, he, he wants everyone to be saved. And he, by the way, he's provided, he's provided what was needed for us to be saved, his son Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'm going to emphasize that over and over and over again these meetings. That it's all about Jesus and what he's done for us and what he can do for us. Would you say amen? It's all about him. It's all about him, folks. While it is evident that not everyone will repent, God's wish is that all people would find salvation in him. Jesus invited all who labor and are heavy laden to come to him. While whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Question number three. Question number three. Is there really a hell? Is there really a hell? Please notice what Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse 28. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 30, 28, Jesus said these words. Do not fear those who kill the what? Body, but cannot kill the what? So, fear was able to destroy both and body where? In hell. Jesus said that, there's, that there is a hell or that there will be a yes. And notice he says, do not fear the one who can kill, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to do soul and body in hell. So I want to share with you that what he's talking about is don't be worried about the, don't be worried about the one who gets this, this, this body right here, temporary body, the first death. You should fear the one that is able to both body, uh, both body and soul. In, and the only one that has that kind of power, the only one that has the love of it, is none other 
on himself. All right. So now, so now let's let's go to let's go to what it says here. Believed that believed that there was a hell. Question number four: When is hell going to burn? When is hell going to burn? Notice what Matthew, chapter thirteen, verses forty through forty-two. Jesus uses this parable of the wheat and tares. He uses this parable of the wheat and tares. This is what it says: As the tares or weeds are gathered in the fire. So it will be at the what? At the end of this age, the Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of what? Fire. So according to the text, and you guys got to read it carefully. Again, that's why we got to read it carefully and read it in context. According to what he says there, he says there are a couple of key things there. He says that, the tares will be gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at, it will be when? When? At the end of the what? Of the age. Okay, so that means that he's, he's using the analogy of tares being gathered in bundles because that's what the farmers would do. They would gather these, these, these tares in bundles and then they would cast them into the furnace into the fiery furnace, and they would burn them. So what Christ is saying is this. He's saying that they will be burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. And then notice, he says that, that the Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out, his, out of his kingdom all things that offend. And those who practice lawlessness, or who are living in sin, and will cast them into the what? Furnace of fire. So, according to this text, when does, when does, when does hell fire actually, when is hell going to burn? At the what? At the end of the age. Okay, at the end of the age. So, according to Jesus, hellfire will not start burning this age. Which means there's presently no one in hell. Would you say that? There's no one burning in hell tonight. There's no one burning in hell. Contrary to popular belief, there's no one burning in hell tonight. Okay, so let's look at question number five. When will sinners go to hell? When will sinners go to hell? Please notice what the Bible says in the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 28 and 29. Jesus is speaking again. The hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the what? Resurrection of condemnation. Condemnation. And so this is speaking about the two resurrections. The first resurrection which takes place at the second coming of Jesus which begins or marks the beginning of the 1,000 years. And then the second resurrection um, takes place at the end of the 1,000 years. So when will sinners go to hell? And that we're told that we're told that um, it's when, according to this, it says Jesus spoke about two resurrections. One, the resurrection of life would take place at his second coming, while the other, the resurrection of condemnation, would not occur until the end of Revelation's 1,000 years, a whole millennium after the second coming of Jesus. Based on the teachings of Jesus, no one will be subjected to hellfire until after the 1,000 years or after the millennium, okay? And then you have that chart right there in the study guide to help you understand that, to give you a timeline, timeline of when these things are going to take place. Um, question number six, where is hell? Where is hell? I hope nobody here says home. <laughs> okay? I hope nobody here says home. Um, you know, I believe that our homes are to, be a, are to be a little heaven on earth, right? But sometimes it can be hell. Sometimes it can be hell, but, it's, but that's not what the Bible is talking about, okay? Please notice what it says in, in uh, question number six, where is hell? Let's look at what the Bible has to say. Revelation chapter 20, verse 9. Revelation 20, verse 9, it says, They, Satan and all the unsaved, went up on the breath of the what? Of the earth, and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 7. The heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. The Bible teaches that hellfire takes place on the earth while it has been common for people to teach that hell is located in the center of the earth, such an idea is clearly a fallacy, a modern myth. Hellfire consumes the entire planet. And so hellfire is going to take place on the surface of this earth or on this earth. Please notice the next question. What happens to lost people who go to hell? What happens to lost people 
who go to hell. Please notice what the Bible says in these three verses. The soul, the soul who sins shall what? Shall die. The wages of sin is what? Death. And Revelation chapter 20, verse 14, describes it this way. This hellfire is the second what? The second death. You guys notice that? So the soul that sins shall die. The wages of sin is what? Death. And then hellfire is what death? The second death. Okay? The second death. So here we are. By the way, the first death, the first death is, is, is simply temporary. The first death is temporary. But then the second death is eternal. The second death is eternal. By the way, I'm so thankful, praise God, that Jesus, if we accept him as our Lord and Savior, we are saved and spared the second death. Would you say amen? amen. We're saved from that. We don't have to experience the second death, folks. We don't have to experience that second death. We don't have to experience eternal separation from God because Christ has gone through it on your behalf and mine. People who find themselves in the fires of hell die in hell. The most well-known verse in the Bible says that anyone who believes in Jesus will not perish. The Bible does not teach that people will suffer in hell throughout eternity. So don't buy that for a moment. Don't believe that for a second. There's no one burning in hell tonight, and there's no one that's going to be burning in hell throughout all eternity. Okay? So let's go to question number eight. What ultimately is the condition of people who are burned in hell? What ultimately is the condition of people who are burned in hell? Please notice what the book of Malachi, chapter 4, verses 1 and 3 say. Behold, the day is coming, burning like a what? Burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be what? Will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be what? They shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. So listen, beloved, the Bible makes it very clear. Again, it's not, it's not eternal punishing. It's not eternal torment and torturing and burning. The Bible makes it very clear that we're going to be like stubble. Stubble is like, you know, um, hay or, or very dry grass or, you know, something that's very dry. And what happens to something that's very dry? When you set it on fire, it just what? It just goes up in smoke. It just goes up in fire like that, right? That's why all these fires that have been taking place in California and other places, that's why it spreads like crazy because much of that, much of that, much of that um, land that is being burned, a lot of it is dry. It's, it's, I mean, it's a really dry climate. So, and I want you guys to notice something else too. Notice that it says that not only will you be like stubble, but it says that you will also be ashes under the sole of their feet. The wicked are going to be going to be trampled upon and they're going to be ashes under the sole of your feet so the bible makes it very clear you know those that will be burned by the way it says it says root and branch in the gospel of john chapter 15 jesus says that i am the vine you are the what you are the branches and that if you abide in me and i in you you will bear much fruit i want you guys to notice that that, that the prophet malachi uses a similar analogy here he is saying that all those who continue in sin and continue in wickedness, they will be connected to their, their root, which is the devil. The devil is the root of all evil. And, and then those who connect with him, they will be the branches. The Bible tells us that they will be burnt up, both root and branch. Beloved, that should not be any one of us. Would you say amen? By the way, in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 25, it tells us that Hellfire has been prepared for the devil and his angels, so not one single one of us in here have any business being in that fire. Okay? God did not prepare it for us. God did not prepare it for us. It's not meant to be for us. And so I want you to notice, that's question number eight. The Bible is unambiguous when discussing the fate of the lost in hell. Hellfire destroys the wicked. It is not, it is not God's intention that the wicked should exist forever. In fact, it is not possible that the wicked could exist forever. Eternal life is a gift given to those who have faith in Christ. The lost are lost because they do not have faith in Jesus. God will not grant immortality to those who have not chosen to love him. As 1 John chapter 5, verse 12 says, He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. The lost do not have the Son and therefore cannot live forever, even in hell. Excuse me. So let's go to question number nine. What effect does hell have on the devil? 
What effect does hell have on the devil? Notice what it says in Ezekiel 28, verse 18. Ezekiel 28, verse 18, it says, Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to what? I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. Praise be to God, the devil himself will be burned in hell fire, and he will be also turned into ashes. Would you say amen? He's going to be turned into ashes. So, once again, hellfire takes place at the end of the age. It's not burning right now. And it also takes place on this earth. On this earth. Let's go to question um, number 10. And as, you're, as we're going there, let me read this. Even the devil is reduced to ashes by the fires of hell. Satan and his angels will not be given authority to torture the lost in hell. Satan himself along with every fallen angel, will be blotted out of existence in the fires of hell. Hell exists to cleanse the world, to rid the planet and the universe of every last trace of sin. God has no interest in reserving a small corner of the universe as an eternal cesspool where people enduring indescribable torment suffer for all eternity. As he did in the days of Noah, God will cleanse the world once again. But this time, Affliction will not rise up a second time, Nahum 1.9. Sin and sinners will be gone forever. Would you say amen? They will be gone forever. They will be gone forever. And so that's, what, that's the effect, folks, that, um, that hellfire is going to have on the devil. And the Bible makes it very clear. You know, so I want, you guys, I want you guys to follow me real quickly here. So this is, this is, this is uh, the sequence of events. Jesus comes again. When Jesus, come, when Jesus returns to this planet the, the, the second time, the Bible tells us that um, all those who are alive, all those who are alive and remain, well, first of all, it says that the dead in Christ shall rise what? First. And then those who are alive and remain, those who have been faithful to Jesus and are alive when he comes, it says that they're going to both be caught up with those who have been resurrected. So the living saints and the resurrected saints are all going to go to heaven with Jesus at the first resurrection. At the same time, the wicked living perish at the sight of Jesus. And those who are the wicked who have been dead, they remain dead for a thousand years. Okay. Now, after the thousand years are done, now we come back down to planet Earth. We're all in the city of the New Jerusalem. We land on this planet and then the wicked dead are resurrected. The wicked dead are resurrected. And the Bible says that they surround the city. They surround the city. And as a result of that, that's when fire rains down from heaven and devours them as they make one last ditch attempt to take the city and to remove God from off of the throne. Please, please think about this. All right. So we have all this sequence of events. So that fire that comes down from heaven that devours the devil and the wicked, that's what is known as hell fire. Okay? That's hell fire. That's not that's 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 what hell fire is right there. Okay? And so the Bible is very clear about that. The Bible is very clear. And the other thing is, check this out. So that means that when the fire falls upon the wicked and the devil, we're all going to be in the new city of the, the new Jerusalem. And like I shared I think the other night, we're all going to have the the privilege the blessing and the opportunity to actually see God cleanse the earth and recreate and make a new earth. Would you say amen? Like, can you imagine you're standing there in the city, you're seeing through the walls, and God says, poof, let there be trees. Poof, let there be animals. Poof, let there be this and that. I mean, he's recreating this planet. He's recreating this world, and we're going to be able to witness it. Wow. I can't wait. Let's go to question number 10. But doesn't the Bible say that the wicked will burn forever? Doesn't the Bible say the wicked will burn forever? Please notice what it says in Revelation chapter 14, verse 11. Revelation chapter 14, verse 11. The smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. There it is. The smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of what? fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night for how long? Forever and ever. Okay? So, all right, Pastor Nehemiah, you said that there's no contradictions in the Bible. You said that, uh, you said that, uh, that God is not going to torment people forever and ever, and yet 
Here are the verses to prove it. All right, well, let's take a look at that, shall we? Let's take a look at that and let's unpack that. So let me just go here. Um, notice notice uh, as we have already seen, the Bible teaches that Satan will be reduced to ashes. Again, either he's going to be reduced to ashes or is he being tormented and tortured forever and ever? Which one is it? Okay, because the Bible says, the Bible basically almost, it sounds like it's saying both. But now let's go to it. As we have already seen, the Bible teaches that Satan will be reduced to ashes in the fires of hell. It is impossible for the devil to be reduced to ashes and to burn forever and ever at the same time. All right? So let's go to question number 11. Now the Bible, the Bible uses words and phrases. And notice what it says. What does forever mean when it refers to hell fire? What does forever mean when it refers to hellfire? Please notice what it says in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 22. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 22. Hannah said to her husband, not until the child is weaned. By the way, Hannah is the mother of Samuel. Is the mother of Samuel. And she says, not until the child is weaned, then I will take him that he may appear before the Lord and remain there for how long? And remain there for how, for how long? Forever. And then in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 28, she says, I also have lent him to the Lord as long as he what? As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. So here's the question. By the way, she, 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 uh, she dedicated Samuel to the Lord and she gave Samuel to the Lord's service. She gave him to the temple. She let him stay there with Eli and his two wicked sons. It's interesting. But she said here that I'm going to, I'm going to be, appear before the Lord or take him that he may appear before the Lord and remain there for how long? Remain there forever. Remain there forever. But in that very same chapter, just a few verses down, she says, I also have lent him to the Lord as long as he what? Lives. He shall be lent to the Lord. So here's the connection. According to the passage, what we're reading here is that forever basically is saying that forever in this context is saying that, that Samuel is being lent to the Lord forever or for as long as he what? As long as he lives. Okay, let me, let me go on to another one. You guys know the story of Jonah and the great fish, right? The great fish. Notice what it says here. Jonah chapter 2 verse 6. What does forever mean when it refers to hellfire? I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me. For how long? Forever. But then notice, Jonah chapter 1 verse 17. Jonah was in the belly of the fish. How long? Three days and three nights. But now to Jonah, do you think that being in the belly of that fish, <laughs> I mean, think about it, being in the belly of that fish, up and down, up and down. And then he's got seaweed wrapped around his face and his head, and he's got all this other stuff in that belly of that fish. You know, he's got, he's got, he's got these uh, digestive, um, you know, um, fluid and all of that stuff flowing around him. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, so think about it. And it's smelly in there. It's dark in there. So do you think that to Jonah, it felt like it was forever? Yeah. I mean, he's saying, he's saying, I went down to the moorings of the mountains and the earth with its bars closed behind me forever. But we know that he wasn't in there forever because he was only in there for three days and three nights. I'd like to illustrate it this way myself. Because a lot of us use it. I don't know how many of the young people use it today, but I know that we use it quite often. You know, we use it quite often. When I take my wife to the mall. Right? I take my wife to the mall. By the way, me, I don't like going to the mall. I don't like going shopping. And if I do go and get something, I'm in and out. I, I, I know what I want to get. I'm going to go over there and I'm going to get it and I'm out. My wife, she'll say, honey, you guys going to wait in the car? I say, yeah. She says, okay, I'll be right back. <laughs> right back. Right back. And I'm sitting, I'm sitting in the car with Nija and Charity. Okay? And they both start screaming their heads off. They both make a mess in their diaper. Right? I'm sitting in the car. I'm sitting in the car. Time is going. Time is going. And I want to tell you right now that for me, it seemed like she was in there for how long? forever <laughs> but was she no no now if 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 i decided if i decided you know what folks after we're done with the meeting here tonight i'm going to go ahead and walk all the way home to ording <laughs> some of you're going to be like pastor you're crazy that's going to take how long forever okay so i mean we we use that we use that 
that term in much the same way. It's not, talking, it's not, it's not like, you know, it's, it's an actual forever. It's just saying that you're taking what? For, forever. You're taking along. You, you, you're in there long. And so that's why, that's why the Bible, is, it's, it's interesting. It's just saying that as long as one lives. That's why it's important for us to compare Scripture with Scripture. Do you know that Isaiah said that we are to, look, we are to take line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little? We're to go back and forth throughout the Bible and allow the Bible to interpret itself. Okay? Let's go to, let's go to uh, number 12. Man. Go to number 12. Let me, let me just read what it says here. Um, Jonah said that he was in the sea forever, yet the Bible explains it as being a time period of three days and three nights. As with Samuel, at the temple, forever did not mean forever in the sense of an event lasting eternally. Because let me ask you something. Is, is Samuel right now, is Samuel right now still serving in the temple? No. No, he's, he's, he's asleep. He's waiting for the second coming of Jesus. All right? And then it says, um, if forever meant, meant eternal, we could still expect to find Samuel in the temple today and Jonah still in the belly of the fish. While on two occasions the Bible refers to hellfire as lasting forever, it uses the phrase forever in the same way it does on dozens of other occasions, where forever refers to as long as an event should last. Many times, the Bible uses the phrase forever in conjunction with an event that has long expired. Okay, let's go to question number 12. What event does the Bible use as being an example of what hell, hell will be like? Jude verse 7, Jude verse 7 Notice what it says, Sodom and Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them are set forth as in what? As an example, suffering the vengeance of what kind of fire? Of eternal fire, of eternal fire. And then it says here in 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 6, turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into what? Into ashes, condemn them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. And so in one text it says here, um, those texts said that Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities around them, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And then 2 Peter says that the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were turned into ashes. Question, is Sodom and Gomorrah still burning today? No. No, we, we know that it's not burning tonight. The Bible states clearly that the experience of Sodom and Gomorrah was an example of eternal fires of hell. Clearly, eternal does not mean that the fires of hell would burn eternally. Sodom and Gomorrah are not still burning today. While the effects of hellfire are eternal, sinners in hellfire will be, as Sodom and Gomorrah were, reduced to ashes. Question number 13. For whom was hell designed? Here we go. For whom was hell designed? Notice what it says in Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Jesus here speaking says, Depart from me, ye cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for who? Prepared for the devil and who else? And his angels. And his angels. Hell was conceived as a means of ridding the universe of sin and the arch sinner, Satan. In Ezekiel 33, verse 11, God says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Those who choose the service of Satan over the service of God will be destroyed along with Satan and the fallen angels in what Matthew 25, 41, 41 calls everlasting fire. And so, uh, once again, beloved, I want to share with you that none of us have any business being in hellfire because it's not, it's not meant for us. It's meant for the devil and his angels. And I thank God that Jesus, that Jesus has died on, on the cross so that we don't have to experience hellfire and the second death. Would you say amen? Let's go to question number 14. Why does the Bible mention unquenchable, unquenchable, unquenchable fire if the fires of hell will eventually burn out? Well, notice what Jesus says in Luke chapter 3, verse 17. The chaff he will burn, or John, the chaff he will burn with what? With unquenchable fire. Unquenchable fire. In Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 27, God discusses a fire that shall not be quenched. This fire is referred to in 2 Chronicles 36, 19 through 21, and took place when Jerusalem was destroyed by Babylon. Jerusalem is not still burning today. God is clarifying a very solemn point. Nothing will be able to to in any way lessen the seriousness of hellfire. Hell will burn until it has done its work. Nothing will be able to escape the seriousness of hell. It will be completely, it will completely annihilate everything it touches. 
Okay, we're almost done here. Revelation, or Luke chapter 16, verse 6, uh, 19 through 31, it says, What about the story of the rich man and Lazarus? What about the story of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke chapter 16, verse 19 through 31? Let me, let me just share with quickly um, thoughts about that. I want to just share with you, I don't, I don't want to take too much time because it's, it's, uh, it's in your study guide and you can read it for yourself. But the story of the rich man and Lazarus is simply this. The rich man and Lazarus is, a, is, is following along Luke 15, Luke 15, a bunch of parables. And so we look at the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man and Lazarus is also a parable, all right? It is not to be taken literally. It is not to be taken literally. Please just notice a couple of things that are written down here. The story of the rich man and Lazarus is, par is a parable. Jesus shared this story not to illustrate the realities of the afterlife, but to teach his hearers some vital lessons. Number um, A, wealth in the case of the rich man is not a guarantee of God's blessings. Neither is poverty in the case of Lazarus, Lazarus a sign of lacking God's blessings. Because back then in the Jewish, in the Jewish culture or in the Jewish nation, they always, they, always, um, um, they always had this thought that if you were wealthy and if you had a lot, you were blessed of who? You were blessed by God. And if you were poor and if you were suffering from some type of disease or something or sickness, you were considered cursed of who? Cursed of God. And I want to share with you that that's not true. And Jesus was trying to, make, trying to share with them, listen, just because you're wealthy and just because you have money and just because you have possessions does not mean that you are blessed of God. It does not mean that you are saved. It does not mean that you are better than anyone else. And so Christ was trying to drive home that point. Let me go to, let me go to B. Salvation is not by birthright. What was one of the things that the leaders of Israel always boasted about whenever they had confrontations with Jesus? They would always say that we are the sons of who? We are the sons of Abraham. We are the sons of Abraham. And so they boasted about their lineage. They boasted about, you know, um, their, their, their family background and all of that. So he's saying that their birthright, salvation is not by birthright. Many Jews felt that because they were the descendants of Abraham, they were guaranteed salvation. This parable demonstrated to Jesus' hearers that heredity does not provide eternal life. Would you say amen? And this is a good point to, that I want to get on here. Listen, listen carefully um, to what I'm going to share. Just because, just because your parents are good Christians, and just because your parents are good Christians, and they have a relationship with Jesus, does not automatically mean that we as children are going to have automatic interest into the kingdom of God. I want to share with our young people and with all of us that all of us in this room must have our own individual relationship with Jesus. Would you say amen? amen. We're not going to be saved because our parents are saved. That's not how it works. Okay? I'm not going to ride my dad's coattails into the kingdom. My dad and mother had their own relationship with, the, with, with Jesus. They had their own personal relationship with Jesus. And so we're not going to ride somebody else's coattails into the kingdom of God. All of us, all of us must have our own personal relationship and walk with Jesus. Even being born into an Adventist home won't cut it. Are you guys hearing me? Even being born into an Adventist church and home won't cut it. Even going to all of our Adventist schools won't cut it. Now, praise be to God that it's a blessing to be born into a Christian or Adventist home. It's a blessing to be able to go to our church schools. Nothing wrong with public schools. Well, let me, let me take that back. I went to public school. I'll just say that I believe that Christian education is, is, is better than our, our public school system. However, I, still, I, I do know, though, that God still works with our kids even in the public schools. Would you say amen? amen. So I don't, I don't want to denigrate that in any way. I don't want to put it down in, you know, in any way. But I, I will say this. That's why I'm making the point. That it doesn't matter if you were born and raised in a Christian home. It doesn't matter if you were born and raised as an Adventist, that you went to our schools, that you went to college or universities and you got all of these degrees. If you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, it will all amount to nothing. Okay? So... The last one here is believers must follow what is written in the Bible. In the parable, the rich man is told that if his brother would not hear Moses and the prophets, they would not believe. Even if one 
of them rose from the dead. Interestingly enough, interestingly, a man named Lazarus did rise from the dead. And rather than believe in Jesus, the religious leaders plotted to have Lazarus murdered. Can you guys believe that? I mean, man, Jesus told them, he said, listen, you know, and they, what, what was it that they, they kept asking Jesus? Give us a what? Give us a sign and we'll what? And we'll believe you. If you just do something, we'll believe you. And what did he do? He gave them the, 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 the crowning miracle of all, the greatest miracle of all, by raising Lazarus to what? To life. He said, even if a man were to be raised from the dead, you wouldn't believe. And sure enough, he raised Lazarus to life. And the Bible tells us that that was not good enough for them. In fact, they were plotting to take Lazarus' life again. And so, beloved, I want to share with you that this is so, this is so crucial. I don't, I don't want us to... I, I don't want us to, to just be here, be in church, and listen to, to meetings and things like this just to, get, just to get an intellectual, mental understanding and assent to the truth. It must go from here to here. Because one of the things that I've discovered is we are so good at giving information and we are so well informed, but we have not been transformed. <laughs> we got so much information, but we've not experienced transformation. You know? And I mean, all this stuff that we've been blessed with, all this stuff that God has blessed us with from the word, to know the truth. But unless we have a relationship with Jesus and we see the relational aspect of it, it's all just going to be up here. It's just going to be head knowledge. And then you know what? You come to church on Sabbath because you know, yeah, that's the Sabbath. It's, it's the seventh day of the week, and so, yeah, I'm going to attend. How about, how about I'm so in love with God and I'm so in love with Jesus that that's the reason why I want to be here on Sabbath, you know? That makes all the difference in the world. We can have our head filled with all of this stuff and not be changed or transformed. That's sad. That, that would be sad. But I praise God that you're here tonight and that we're all learning and growing together. Would you say amen? amen. Last question. Last question. What will God do after, after hellfire has burned? What will God do after hellfire has burned? Please notice what it says in Revelation 21 verse 1. I saw a new heaven and a what? And a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more what? No more sea. There was no more sea. So the Bible says that after hellfire has done its work of cleansing. By the way, we're all going to be safe with, inside of the city. And the fire, the, the hellfire that, 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 that destroys or, or uh, the wicked and Satan is going to spread all over, over all the earth and is going to cleanse this earth from every, every, every evidence of sin. God is going to cleanse this earth again and remake it. And, re, and I'm, I'm, I'm just looking forward to that day. Please notice what it says here in closing. After the fires of hell have gone out, God will recreate the earth. Every last trace of sin will be gone. Our eternal home will be a place of beauty and perfection where God will dwell with his people. Hellfire reveals the love, of, the love of a gracious God. After doing everything he can to save every last person for all eternity, God ultimately destroys the earth and, and rids it of every trace of sin. Those who choose not to receive everlasting life will be caused to suffer for eternity. They will be blotted out, will not be caused to suffer for eternity. They will be blotted out of existence. Sin and sinners will be no more. The saved will be free to enjoy eternity without the presence of sin. Would you say amen? amen? Without the presence of sin. And so, that's what God has in store for us. He wants us, he wants to be a part. He wants us to enjoy the new heaven and the new earth that he's going to recreate. But that, that can only happen. That can only happen. Um, you know, the only way that we can be saved is through Jesus Christ. The only way that we can be saved is through Jesus Christ. I have one last, last song from, from Vocali, and then um, Arjun can play to, um, to close us off when we pray. But one last song from Vocali called Glory and Honor. Glory and Honor. We want, to, we want to close tonight with this song and then have prayer, and Arjun can play um, during our prayer time. So, By the way, how many of you are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where there will be no more sin? Would you say Amen. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. 
I'm there with you in heaven what a wondrous joy will be gathered with the angel chorus standing by the glassy sea such a thought is hard to fathom in the presence of my king and with countless ones forgiven gathered round the throne to sing Glory and honor, worthy is the Lamb, the Lamb. Glory and honor, worthy is the Lamb. express it all the ways you reign supreme even death can't hold the vastness or approach this awesome theme you are God and to your glory we will worship and abide in your presence there forever we'll be happy to I'd sing in glory and honor worthy is so worthy is the Lamb glory and honor worthy is so worthy stand with me as we close with prayer this evening let's stand together and pray our father in heaven lord thank you so much for what we have heard tonight lord we have heard your word we thank you for the gift of the holy spirit that is making the truth so clear we thank you for jesus who died on calvary's cross so that we don't have to experience hell fire and the second death Jesus already paid the price for us thank you Jesus Lord I want to pray for all of our young people here tonight I want to pray for all of our parents all of our grandparents all of all of the marriages in this room I pray for the single people I pray Lord that you also be with 
um, all of the leaders here in this church. Please, dear God, we need your presence and your Holy Spirit more than ever. Lord, the world is, the world is heading fast to a close. And we need Jesus. We need Jesus, Lord. So I pray that you will bless us tonight. Thank you for my family here. Please, Lord, let the words that have been spoken and shared burn in our hearts. And Lord, give us a good night's rest tonight. Take us all home safely. And we look forward to coming back tomorrow night to hear about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Let everyone say amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. We'll see you tomorrow night at 7, at 7 p.m.